I'm Rosie Wilby, a comedian who has been researching the psychology of love and relationships for about a decade now, ever since my girlfriend of five years dumped me by email. I did feel much better about it though, once I'd corrected her spelling and punctuation and changed the font, break up in windings, looks far more palatable. Anyway, for the last three years, I've been presenting the Breakup Monologues podcast, which has now become this book. This is the advanced copy. The actual finished cover is going to look like that. Well, by the time you are watching this, actually, the book will be out. So the cover will look like that. Yes, lovely. And the book tells the story of me trying to learn from my past breakups my multiple past breakups, how to finally stay in a relationship with my partner. Let's call her girlfriend and let's meet her now in this section from the prologue of the book. You look beautiful today. Thanks, baby. You're a bit into me today, aren't you? I'm always into you. No, you're not. True. We are driving to a festival in Girlfriend's midlife crisis car, an electric blue BMW convertible. Although the way she drives makes me wonder if you can still describe it as a midlife crisis if it ends up killing us. That would be an end of life crisis and quite a crisis at that. Never mind, the sun is shining, our life is good. We have a fancy loft conversion. We go on ski holidays, we Google things like can dog eat monge too? After two decades of scratching out a creative existence from gig to gig, first as a wistful indie songwriter, then as a willfully grassrootsy comedian, I now get to live like a wanker because my libido went all aspirational on me and drew me to a partner with an actual job. However, three months shy of our three year anniversary, shit has got real. Girlfriend and I have reached a refreshing level of frankness about the fact that our mutual desire has waned. We have teetered and toppled over the parapet of honeymoon bliss and fallen to the ground below, stirred from the anaesthetising effects of the sexy brain chemicals that have propelled us along thus far with relative ease. Suddenly, we are acutely aware of the careers and friends that we have neglected during the happy haze. We have reached the stage where being in a relationship with a fellow human has become a massive pain in the arse. Even though it is a largely excellent relationship that neither of us intends to leave. Repeat, we are not going to break up, not for the foreseeable, not us. In fact, it is the first time I've reached this point and not been planning a daring, dramatic escape. Counting up the significant partners whom I probably would have married if it had been legally available to me all along, I'm now on to my fifth wife. That puts me on a multi-marriage par with Joan Collins. Already, at the age of 48, she was 68 when she married her final husband. If I was going to continue to be a slave to serial monogamy, and if you're reading this, darling girlfriend, of course I'm not, I would have ample time to overtake her and catch up with Liz Taylor and her seven husbands, one of whom she married twice, or even Jar Jar Gabor and her tally of nine. But I'm done with twisting. I think I'd like to stick. I found a funny, sexy, generous partner, even if she does have a ridiculous knobby car. Surely if I left this one, I'd be breaking up with love altogether. It would be my end game. And it is from this position of at least wanting to stay, of accepting the maddening claustrophobia of companionship, that I want to investigate why breakups continue to compel me so much. Perhaps it is because breakups facilitate and maybe even necessitate transformation. In the wake of a separation, our peers allow us to reinvent ourselves. The rest of the time, they like us to stay fixed so that they can move around and ahead of us. But heartbreak is the golden ticket that circumvents this bullshit. Renewed and reborn, standing at the edge of the echoing canyon of our former frustrations, we shout, this is who I am now. 
and we run and skip away from the parched carcasses of the old selves that we have grown to hate. For me, it has been during these fleeting, liberating gaps of singledom that I have really got shit done. I recorded and released an album. I launched a boutique music PR company. I started comedy. I wrote a book. Each time I harnessed any lingering feelings of anger, sadness and confusion and used them as energising forces for creativity, for moving forwards with new insights into my own shortcomings and foibles. I wonder if it is possible to do that much learning and actively stay in a relationship. I hope so. It must be right, or else all long-term couples would be codependent, emotionally stunted weirdos. Oh, hang on. So we're going to fast forward now to a chapter from the second half of the book, where I am starting to be more optimistic about this relationship and realise that I have found a good one. And I have really learnt from my past relationships how to have made that better choice. And also I've learnt from the many experts that I also talk to in the book about the psychology of heartbreak, about compatibility, about how the weird algorithms on online dating websites actually uh, match us together. Although I did once get sent my own profile back to me and <laughs> I was only a 73% match. So there's a chapter where girlfriend and I are on holiday together and we have a lovely conversation on the balcony looking out to the Spanish sea and realise that we are compatible and we've both come to this place of meeting one another later in life for really good reasons because we were ready. And I talk about how I drift off to sleep gazing at the hypnotic rotations of the ceiling fan and thinking about how breakups, while they may hurt at the time, really do shape us in good ways and equip us to make much better choices. So let's find out what happens the next day on holiday. The next morning, one of our neighbours, a tanned local man, walks across the shared courtyard towards the little oval pool as, as we are opening up the balcony doors. Buenos dias, he shouts up, smiling from under the brim of his straw hat. Girlfriend leans on the balcony rail confidently and shouts back, Buenos Aires. I do a double take. Did she just say what I thought she said? She seemed so sure of herself. Surely not. I won't say anything. The man, nodding and still beaming, walks on. After an hour fresco breakfast of nectarines and fresh fluffy bread, we walk down the steep, quiet road towards the beach. Coming back up this isn't going to be fun. I hope we haven't forgotten anything, shouts girlfriend after me as I break into a jog ahead of her, desperate to get into the sea. I think I'll look into hiring a car. Whatever you reckon, baby. Once we walk briskly across the hot sand and settle onto some recliners under umbrellas, we take off our t-shirts, ready to go for a swim. A man on the plane did warn us about the sea at Maraca. It's very rough in the mornings, he said sternly, but it looks fine. A few waves crash up the beach and tickle our toes. Girlfriend steps forward until the water is up to her middle. I follow. Then the floor suddenly disappears from under me and I am somersaulting around inside a washing machine, pebbles and grit forcing their way up into my nose and to every orifice. This is it. I'm dying. Which way up am I? Then I am spat out again onto the beach further up than where I started. My carefully tied, elegant little ponytail has moved around almost to the front of my head. Mud seems to be pouring down my face. I pat my body down to check I'm still wearing both parts of my bikini. Girlfriend is laughing hysterically. Oh my God, look at you. What just happened? A wave quarters, there's a sort of shelf where the water breaks and if you don't get past it quickly, well, you nearly drown? <laughs> Something like that. Come on, let's get showered over there. We'll feel better. I think I'm still in shock. At the dribbly beach shower, I attempt to hose out grit from my bikini bottoms in the least revealing way possible. Finally clean and a bit more refreshed, we buy a cold beer from the beachside bar. Feeling the fuzzy effects of the alcohol immediately, I venture. 
know this morning when that man from one of the apartments said Buenos Dias? Yes. Did you say Buenos Aires back to him? Oh bloody hell, did I? What a knob. A recent study of over 11,000 couples found that in-jokes and shared experiences like perhaps making hapless attempts at foreign languages or getting humiliatingly washing machined in an unexpectedly vicious sea are a vital part of the dynamic that you build with someone. And that, in turn, is so much more important than the characteristics of the two separate individuals in terms of predicting relationship quality and satisfaction. So next time someone says to you, it's not you, it's me, you can call them out on it because science suggests it is neither of you, it's the dynamic between you. So the Breakup Monologues follows my first book, Is Monogamy Dead? which came out a couple of years ago. And this was based on a survey asking what counts as cheating, which I conducted as part of the research for a comedy show that I toured of the same title, Is Monogamy Dead? And I thought it was a really interesting question because it's less black and white than we think. Some people might define those boundaries around emotional fidelity, some people more so around sexual fidelity and what we do in the physical world rather than what we sort of think and feel and whether we fall in love with people and so on. And I just wanted to finish off by sharing a short extract from this with you to round off back to thinking about the girlfriend who dumped me by email and this is a chapter about me being in Australia with this woman. Um, I mean it's a bit sad because it's, it's about how much I was in love with her at the time and it's a bit sad to know that it ended badly. Sometimes things do, that's life. It's all fine now, it's all fine now, happy now. And <laughs> So I'd just like to finish off with this. And it's also important to say for the context in this that uh, this girlfriend was not out to her family and this was pretty problematic in the relationship. Although she did try to reassure me once by telling me that her parents had enjoyed the film Brokeback Mountain. I didn't think that was really giving them a great sense of how well gay relationships could turn out. But there we are. Sarah was at the bar. I smiled at revellers, absorbed the heavy bass thud of competing sound systems carried like insects on the breeze, and soaked up the last glow of fuzzy Australian evening light. We were at Mardi Gras at the height of an adventure. Both of us were wearing straw cowboy hats donated by our hosts, something we would feel idiotic wearing back in England, yet which felt fine here. I felt in a state of utter peace despite being surrounded by neon chaos. My gig had gone really well and I could relax. I'll never understand what happened in those few moments that irrevocably changed the dynamic of our relationship. When you think about what creates love, a spark, a jolt of electricity, a deep recognition, a feeling that I know this, I've been here, an instant connection. Maybe it makes sense that it can be ignited, rekindled or extinguished so quickly. Love makes a mockery of time. It can be nurtured and sculpted over decades like a fine artist chipping away to great work or it can be so utterly fleeting and transient. It can leave you like a passenger on the platform running vainly alongside the departing train and forced to give in, to wait for the next one, the next chance. We had flown to the other side of the world and had metaphorically speaking, turned our hearts upside down. Entering our third year, I was starting to feel a little trapped, a little weighed down by someone who kept spoiling my romantic fantasy, by not stepping up to the plate, by not wanting to be amazing, brave and open together, by not having the vision or courage to move forward into our life. Come on, we can do this, I'd say. Yet, as she turned back towards me that night, Wearing gold and drinks, I felt the air escape from my atmosphere as if I no longer needed oxygen but just to breathe her. I felt my eyes become huge cinema screens, zooming into close-up, her face and smile flooding my retinas like a river bursting its banks. I felt deconstructed and reconstructed, my limbs and organs rearranged in unfamiliar patterns, yet finally all in right place. We had not consumed any drugs or much alcohol.
I can only attribute this earth-shattering, heartbreaking, bewildering, time-stopping feeling to pure, unadulterated love. Who needs drugs when you have this? I say heartbreaking because intrinsically I knew this must be the first time I had seen my girlfriend truly, deeply happy. Away from the pressures of family and work, surrounded by long-lost friends in celebratory mode, here was the woman I'd been searching for. Here was her soul, and inevitably, here also was mine. Yet this was a holiday. How could I save this, keep this, return here, mark it, bottle it? How many times had I said I love you to her before this moment? How could I say it differently now, add deeper resonance, reflect this new dimension, this extra universe of feeling that had snuck up and bolted itself onto my old version of love like a docking spaceship? Did she even feel it too? She must have, as she looked me square in the eyes right then and made a promise. I'll tell them, Rosie. I'll tell them about us. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow me on Twitter at Rosie Wilby and on Instagram at Breakup Monologues. Keep in touch.